Happy Labor Day. It's Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend. Oh, no, not that one. That one. Why do we have it? The short answer is unions. In the late 19th century, many workers labored seven days a week, sometimes up to a grueling 100 hours in poor conditions. Henrik, thanks for the prize. Workers were fed up. Many began to unionize and take to the streets in protest. Violence against them at the hands of corporate union busters and law enforcement was common. Many lost their lives, but they didn't relent. Organized labor kept up the pressure. Workers in the mining, printing, and railroad industries eventually won eight-hour work. Major corporations, most notably Ford Motor Company, began to heed calls to institute five-day work weeks. But most workers across the country were not guaranteed these benefits. Then came Frances Perkins, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's labor secretary and the first woman cabinet secretary. Before agreeing to the position, Perkins met with FDR to secure a guarantee that he would support her pro-labor agenda. To her surprise, Alice, thanks FDR for the tier three. Her. Holy shit, appreciate you. In 1938, you. thanks to her advocacy and the it might momentum be worth pitting built them on by comments, good point. Congress passed Odds, the Fair explain? Labor Standards Act, you make a comment which, for among me, other Bob? things, ultimately established a 40-hour work week by forcing employers to pay time and a half for any hours worked beyond this limit, and thus created the weekend. While many workers now enjoy weekends won by organized labor, the fight continues for those who don't. A rising number of contract employees, sometimes known as gig workers, are putting in back-breaking hours without the protections afforded to full-time workers. Now is the time to renew the historic call of unions to make sure all workers are afforded the dignity and time off from work they deserve. And who knows, maybe one day we'll move to a three-day weekend. Oh, let's fucking go. We need a three-day week. Oh my God, can you imagine how much better life would be with a three-day weekend? What the fuck? Leaving on Thursday, you get done with work, you, you fly on Thursday, you arrive Thursday night, you wake up, you go to bed, you wake up, it's Friday, you're on your vacation, oh, you can have like vacations, not taking any time off, you could just do like really cool weekend trips, because like the whole like Friday traveling to Saturday, that's, that's, you know, you don't have enough time, you have to get ready to leave on Sunday, it sucks. I do time theft Fridays, I got three day weekends anyway, oh no. Don't admit, don't type shit like that on your computer! I have mad respect for the labor movement that got us what, they, what we have. You should. They're amazing. Even the libs are starting to admit it. Labor Day weekend is upon us, and what a summer it has been for American labor. The summer of strikes has affected everyone, from delivery workers and Amazon workers to Hollywood writers and actors, and the Biden administration is now rolling out a proposed change that could affect millions more workers. Right now, people who make less than $35,500 a year are eligible for overtime pay if they work more than 40 hours a week. The Labor Department wants to extend the threshold for eligibility. Oh, God, yeah, I forgot to even mention this. They're doing the overtime change that even if you're not paid hourly right now, if you're paid less than 55 hours or 55,000 per year and they try to make you more than, work more than 40 hours a week, they will need to pay you overtime, even if you're on salary. So this is a huge change. Another really good change. I think it should be 80,000 per year, but it's fine. It's, you know, it's a big, big, big boost. Very good change. Very positive change. And this is the type of stuff that I am glad to see Biden finally doing. I could say, wow, he's not that bad. Look, he's doing a thing. We're doing the negotiation for 10 drugs. Oh my God, 10. You have the uh, restoration of the Joy Silk Doctrine and the National Labor Relations Board, which means that union busting is disgusting. And if you do it, you will get automatically declared union organization success. And then you have this to boost the number of people that are covered by overtime rules. So these are all incredibly positive developments. And I am very happy to be able to show you some W's, even if they are on the small side. 
There's one thing that I want to say. Savor your victories. Because this is... Life sucks. And when you get a W, celebrate. Because it makes the, your enemies discouraged and you rejoicing and it rallies your morale. Savor victories. But be the mouse. When they give you a, when they give you a cookie, ask for a glass of milk. But still enjoy that fucking cookie. We are fighting. The left is fighting for like actual change. For time to workers who make less than $55,000 a year, that would add about 3.6 million more workers to the mix. With unemployment at a decade's low rate of 3.5 percent, the Biden administration touting 13.4 million jobs created in his term thus far, it appears that things may be looking a little brighter for the average American worker. Joining us now is Independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, Chairman of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Senators, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. I, I did that setup to sort of ask you because labor and the workers seem is central to the things that you think about. About the state of the American worker right now, we are in a summer of strikes. There are a whole lot of Americans who are on the picket lines right now. There was one big strike at UPS that was averted. American Airlines has just, pilots have voted uh, overwhelmingly to authorize a strike if they don't come to a deal with the airline. Where are we right now, in your opinion, with labor in America? Well, I think what's going on now, Ali, is that workers are catching on to the fact that in America we see an unprecedented level of corporate greed in company after company, we're seeing record-breaking profits. We're seeing more income and wealth inequality than we've ever seen in the history of this country. And yet today, the average American worker in real inflation accounted for dollars actually is earning less than he or she did 50 years ago. So workers are saying, you know what? Hey, maybe in this economy, we deserve a fair shake, and we're going to stand up and fight for it. And I think what the Teamsters did uh, in their contract negotiations with UPS, great step forward. They stood up. They were prepared to strike. They told UPS, which is making billions of profits, you know, what, treat us like good, decent human beings. And that's what ended up happening. They won that conflict. And we've got to see that all over the country. And I just want to correct something I said. It's the flight attendants at uh, American Airlines who have voted to authorize strike, not the pilots. But yeah, you're right. When I spoke to the, 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 the head of the Teamsters and I said, you know, UPS is a big part of American GDP. Are you worried that a strike can have an impact on it? And he said to me straight up, he said, it is what it is. If we go on strike and a big chunk comes out of American GDP, we have to do what we have to do. Look, people are catching on that the inflation that we have gone through really had not all that much to do with the war in Ukraine or broken supply chains. Have you ever it met had or to do with the fact with Bernie? that yeah, I met Bertie in 2015 was called Keystone Progress, which is a annual meeting of left wing and socialist groups in Harrisburg. And, you know, usually we have a few, you know, we have some left wing leaders come in. It's kind of a, uh, networking and you know best practices sharing opportunity and then bernie was the keystone speaker in 2015 <clears throat> before his like presidential announcement corporation after corporation whether it's the oil industry whether it's the food industry whether it's those people who own large amounts of housing raising their pro raising their prices and making huge amounts of money so i think workers are organizing they want to join unions when they're in a union, they're fighting for a decent contract, and that's the right thing to do. And, and yet, what I would and, say to you, Ali, go ahead. in terms of the campaign that's coming, we've got to ask ourselves a very simple question. How does it happen that somebody like Donald Trump, who has been impeached twice, indicted four times, is a pathological liar, and I think most Americans understand is corrupt. You know what? He's running even to Biden in the polls. Mm -hmm. What's that about? What is and that what's about? that about? To, what's that about, to my mind, is you got millions of working class people out there who say, you know, I understand Trump is a phony, but he claims at least to be standing for us. Who cares about us? And what we have got to do, what the Democrats have got to do, is begin to engage in class politics. 
to understand that we've been in a class war now for a Bernie decade. that's helping Republicans by asking Biden to do something. It's very funny that the moment that I I had a whole bunch of libs yelling at me because I said exactly this. I said exactly this, and I said, if you don't do this, then people are going to vote for Cornell West, or they're not going to show up, or they're going to be lured by Trump's lies. You've got to have a real, strong platform, and we've got to do what Bernie is saying. The Republicans are fucking bad. It's time to make a stand. 70% of people don't like Republicans. Why are you appealing to the 30% of people that do? Fuck those people. Appeal to normal people. It's, and the wrong class is winning. And, and here, chat, I want to show you an example of class warfare from yesterday. Hong Kong is building public housing on a golf course and a snub to the old elite. What's the old elite? The British colonial elite and their collaborators. The government is pressing ahead with plans to take back the land despite loud opposition from wealthy golf club members underscoring the gravity of Hong Kong's housing problem. The decision to build on the golf course reflects how old business elites in Hong Kong are losing political sway as more staunchly pro-Beijing loyalists gain ground. Hong Kong's government will be taking back a large chunk of an exclusive golf course near the border with mainland China to build much-needed public housing, a move that has provoked an unusual schism between the city's political class and its powerful business elite. Oh, are the business elites mad their golfy course is getting taken? Another Chinese W. Some 32 hectares or 79 acres of land from the Fainling Golf Course will be resumed on Friday to be, uh, build 12,000 apartments a day after the Hong Kong Golf Club's current lease expires. Swath of land known as the Old Course was built in 1911 and is the oldest 18-hole course in Greater China. Members pay an entrance fee of 400,000 Hong Kong dollars, 51,000 to join, and some have been vocal in their opposition to the redevelopment plan, citing ecological, commercial, and social reasons to make... Oh, the ha oh look at how they can make the fucking wokest arguments to keep their golf course! The government's insistence on pressing ahead despite objections from the elite reflects the urgency it faces in resolving social issues like housing, with Hong Kong persistently ranking as the most unaffordable housing market in the world. Beijing directly exhorted local officials to fix the problems in the aftermath of the mass protest that rocked the city in 2019, demanding that Hong Kong get rid of so-called cage homes or subdivided apartments by 2049. When Beijing's top official for the city visited April, he didn't meet with the Real Estate Developers Association, which represents the richest families, raising questions of whether the interests of the wealthy clans are even a major concern to the... Oh my God! This is why you read the... This is why you read the business press. This is why you read... They don't even care about the richest real estate developers! This is a government that particularly wants to build its foundation on the grassroots, said Carlos Liu, head of the Department of Government and Public Administration at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It wants to show to the central government that has the ability to solve livelihood issues. The government first introduced the idea to take back the golf course in 2019. One advantage of the plan is that building on government-owned land avoids problems that would arise from clearing and rehousing existing residents on private land. The idea of redeveloping golf courses into housing is much more mature in Singapore, where the government laid out a plan in 2014 for how it bounced the need for housing with golfing. Last year, a golf club moved out of its original site when the lease expired to make way for public homes. The city state also recently halted horse racing in order to redevelop the race course to meet housing needs. In recent months, the government has held public hearings to solicit views. Li Ning, the son-in-law of Hong Kong's fourth richest person, Li Xiao Qi, attended one such event in June to oppose the plan on the grounds that it would harm the development of golf in Hong Kong. In a document... Oh, wow! 14,000 apartments or developing the golf in Hong Kong. What? The view is echoed by Alan Zeman, a Canadian businessman who... Chat, there's only two things that matter in this world. Are you a proletarian or a bourgeoisie? That's it! A Canadian businessman who became a Chinese citizen is best known for developing Hong Kong's nightlife. Demon argued that shrinking the golf course at the heart of the uh, it hits at the heart the way business is done in the city. A lot of deals are done on the golf course all over the world for business people. It is wrong in today's climate to take back the golf course. 
he added at a time when Hong Kong desperately wants to attract business and people from overseas. Opposition comes from the inner circle of Hong Kong leader Jean Lee. Lawmaker Regina Ip, who is the, also the convener of the cabinet, wrote in the social media post in July that the plan severely impacts the development of local golf sports and creates social divisions, pitting golf enthusiasts against the rest of society. Oh, are golf enthusiasts against? Well, then stop opposing public housing. While the golf course will be returned as planned on September 1st, its timeline could be affected by a judicial review launched by the Hong Kong Golf Club against the government's environmental impact assessment that conditionally greenlit the proposed construction. The court has suspended the assessment while it waits for a court ruling without approval of which the government cannot start building. To address the acute housing problem, the government is obliged to take forward land supply projects as vigorously as we can, the Development Bureau said in a statement. Z Lu Shan, deputy director at nonprofit Society for Community Organizations, said that it is imperative that the new homes on the golf course are built. The current wait time for a public housing unit is 5.3 years as the end of March, according to government data, with 130,100 people in line. Many of them are living in dire conditions, he added. The line will only get bigger without those 12,000 units, she said. China! I hate golf so much, such a wasteful sport. Listen, I think that... So I'll be a centrist on this. I think sub amount of golf courses are fine, but they should be in places where they're not disrupting the rest of society. Put them in rural areas. Put them in undeveloped areas. Rich people can afford to go and travel to the golf course. It doesn't need to be in the middle of Hong Kong. Okay, just okay, Joe. Well, the Chinese Communist Party hear you, George. I would love to play you more Carlin chat, but unfortunately, whoever owns his estate is the one of the most litigious fucking rats in the planet. It really sucks, but it is what it is. It's very annoying, and I don't want to deal with their bullshit. So, uh, that you know, that is what it is. I'm sorry I can't show you the clip. I gotta be clear in standing up for the working class of this country, raising the minimum wage, passing labor law legislation, making it easier for workers to join unions, reforming our health care system so that we move to a universal health care system, not of 85 million uninsured or underinsured, substantially lower the cost of prescription drugs, build the affordable housing that we need. We need to start standing up for the working class, not just the big campaign contributors and the one percent. All right. So you and I have had many talks about the universality of health care, health care and why it's so weird that America doesn't have it. We made a, a you know, some people say a very big step, but it, it, in the grand scheme of things, it was a small step with the uh, prescription drug discussion, that taking these 10 prescription drugs and allowing Medicare to uh, negotiate for them the same way Costco negotiates for a better price on peanut butter because they're a bulk buyer. And everybody's mm -hmm. out there calling it communism and, and socialist Jero price Killer, fixing and all this month. kind of stuff. It's a little step. It's a meaningful $50 Ali, billion dollar step, but it's Ali. a little step. It's not everybody, it's just the ruling class. It's just the pharmaceutical industry that makes tens of billions of dollars in profit every single year by charging us the highest prices in the world. It's the Chamber of Commerce, it's the big corporations. Oh my God, imagine that, the government is actually doing something for working people to lower the cost of prescription drugs. This must be communism. This is awful and horrible. All right, 80% of the American people support Medicare negotiating prices. So it's not everybody. The vast majority of the people understand that the pharmaceutical industry is incredibly greedy. But we have got to go further. This, as you indicate, is a very tepid step forward. We're going to bring the legislation in, which does something very simple. It says, you know what? In America, we should not be paying 10 times more for the same drugs as Canada or Europeans are paying. We're going to pay the same prices. And I'm sure the industry will go crazy and put all kinds of 30-second ads on TV. But bottom line is, that's what the American people want. Healthcare is the same thing. Our healthcare system is totally broken. It should not be employer-based healthcare. We've got to do, as you and I have chatted about many times, what Canada, what other countries do. We just healthcare need a public option. See, this is the thing. Like, obviously I support Medicare for all, but there's the thing about a public option. If you make what they call a strong public option, it will destroy health insurance industry. So all you need is to, it'll, it'll collapse on its own if we do the strong public option, okay? 
Or you could just make sure it's more orderly by doing Medicare for all. But I'm also in favor of doing a strong public option and, and letting it rot and die. Both of those strategies are fine. I think that Medicare for all would be much more relaxing for everybody and less disruptive. Because I And I don't want these insurance companies to hang on and fight this with every knife they've got. I'd rather just take them out, you know, quickly and, and efficiently. But a strong public option does the job too. It's just more disruptive and violent, which again, I'm okay with. That's why they're scared of the public option. And these insurance companies, they fight the public option the same thing as they do Medicare for all. If you're a person who's like, well, public option is more moderate. That's more reasonable. It doesn't matter to the insurance companies. They fight them as if they're the same thing. Uh, let me see if I can find this. I want to show you an example. It's from uh, 2020. Yeah, I found it. It's been a time for family, a time to be careful, a time to consider our choices, especially our healthcare choices. Some have proposed an idea called the public option. They make it sound great, but here's what they don't tell you. Your taxes would pay for a public option, one that would become this country's third largest government program. Instead, let's let private coverage, Medicare and Medicaid work together to deliver the access all Americans deserve. This is the type of shit that Bernie's talking about. Uh, there's even more. Let me see if I can find more. Uh, Colorado wanted to do a public option. They fought against it. Healthcare is a human right, not a privilege. We should not be spending $13,000 for every man, woman, and child while 85 million are uninsured. Right, this is the other every one. American wants healthcare they can afford and trust. The public option does the opposite. It's government-controlled health insurance, a one-size-fits-all approach that could raise our payroll taxes by $2,300 and become the third largest government program. Americans want more health care choices and lower costs, and for private coverage to work together with Medicare and Medicaid. Let's build on what's working, not start over. Oh, that's, uh, it's working really well. Like every mom, I care a lot about my family's health care. The new government control health insurance systems politicians are pushing are a real threat to our health care coverage and yours. Medicare for all, Medicare buy-in, and the public option won't lower our health care costs. But these government control proposals could double everyone's income taxes. Paying higher taxes or higher premiums for worse care? It's time to say no to proposals we can't afford. Blatant fucking lies. That they spend millions of dollars putting this shit on TV. And notice something, chat. Comments are turned like off. Like every month. Comments are turned off. They know what they are. Every American deserves access to affordable, high quality health care. But one size fits all government health insurance systems like Medicare for All, Medicare Buy In, and the public option do the opposite. American families would face higher taxes, longer wait times, and lower quality care. They take choice and control away from patients and give it to politicians. We can't afford a one-size-fits-all system. Let's build on what's working and fix what's broken, not start over. So do you notice how everything is the same? Like the health insurance companies attack whether you do Medicare for all or you do a public option or Medicare buy-in. They do this, they, they attack it the same exact fucking way, in the same exact, it doesn't matter. So you should pick the best policy to push. So Joe Biden's strategy of picking, picking a shittier policy because it's more moderate doesn't work. You should just pick the best policy that gives the best coverage and saves the most money, which is Medicare for all. Duh. Look who funds it. These are health insurance companies and right-wing lobbyists. Ohio Manufacturers Association. Iowa Retail Federation. This is every disgusting... The Farm Bureau of Colorado. What the fuck is this shit? The Black Chamber. The Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Hey, wait a minute. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Who have I heard that's related to Blue Cross Blue Shield? Huh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, huh? Hmm. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Gretchen Wil Whitmer was born in August 23rd, 1971 in Lansing, Michigan. The eldest of three children of Sharon H. Sherry Reising and Richard Whitmer, who were both attorneys. Her father was head of the State Department of Commerce 
under Governor William Milliken, a Republican and president of C and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan from 1988 to 2006. Huh. Huh. Weird. I don't know. Maybe the Blue Cross Blue Shield CEO's daughter is probably not the, 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 you know, hope for the future of the Democratic Party. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Short run, Richard. I, I will say, as a guy who gets accused of being a communist a lot, how do you explain to people that that what what, you, what this bill is about prescription drugs is causing people who wish to sell into Medicare, which is a, a major distributor of drugs, to negotiate a price, to negotiate a price, not government control of the manufacture of drugs. And if you don't want to negotiate a price, guess what? Sell it on the free market outside of Medicare. That's your choice. This is such a radical idea, Ali. It's what every other major country in the world does. Everyone. It's what that's, the Europeans do, the Canadians do. That's we are how the radical only it is. country. We are the only country in the world that says to the drug company, oh, you want to charge, you know, half of the, this is really crazy stuff. Half of the new drugs now coming onto the market, you know what their treatment is? You know how much it costs? Over $200,000. It's insane. It is absolutely insane. If people can't afford it, Medicare is going to go bankrupt, or premiums are going to go soaring. So what we have got to tell the pharmaceutical industry is we want research, we want development, we want you to deal with cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, all the terrible illnesses out. But all your drugs in the world don't mean anything if people cannot afford it. The function of the pharmaceutical industry is to help cure disease, not to make billionaires even richer. Is it your sense, uh, I've only got a minute here, is it your sense that Democrats are doing enough to tell people that they're working for them? Because I heard from you a little early in this conversation no. your sense that you don't think they are. No, of course not, they're not. And that's why Trump is doing as well as he is. I don't think that the average worker out there thinks, believes with Trump, let's give more tax breaks to billionaires. It's worth agrees. noting that uh, physicians for a national health care program do not support a public option. They view it as a poison pill that private insurers will dump their higher risk patients to. Well, yeah, obviously. But you can't, you have to just not allow them to do that. You know, how you write the public option is very important. That's why I say a, a strong public option will destroy the health insurance industry anyway. But yes, that's a definite risk. That's why Medicare for All is better. It's with Republicans who want to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid education. They don't believe that. But they don't believe that the Democrats are standing up and fighting for them and taking on the corporate greed that exists out there right now. And that's what the Democrats should be doing. And if they do that... Biden's going to win this election in a landslide. Senator, good to see you as always. Thank you for spending some time That's with exactly us. That's exactly what I argue on Twitter. I will happily vote for Biden if he fights these scum-sucking pieces of shit. That's all.